Hello, and welcome to another episode of Not Another Nutrition Podcast. This podcast is on dieting, being in a calorie deficit, fat loss whilst breastfeeding. And this has been a long time coming. It's something that I've spoken on quite a lot before. My Instagram stories, it's something that I've talked about um, in various mentoring groups or Facebook groups, what the mentoring lab. Um, our Mac Nutrition Mentoring Lab, that is, talking to other professionals who have been confused by misinformation. And the misinformation is quite prevalent, and it's something that irks me quite a lot because I see lots of, I mean, it's just a non-evidence-based realm, and uh, I suppose a little bit of a chip on my own shoulder is that females in this realm being a little bit um, aggressive as though being a female somehow makes them more of an authority or having breastfed makes them more of an authority, which is not true. It's a bit like if any of you are aware of Tim Noakes, the low-carb zealot, he believes he's more of an expert than anyone else, including, you know, some of the world's leading experts and researchers simply because he had diabetes so therefore he's a lead, therefore he's an expert on diabetes obviously it gives you some insight great the problem is it only gives you the thing that makes us as humans a bit stupid i.e. personal experience because we often observe something and with our simple minds reduce that down to the most simple explanation and miss out all the nuance which science allows us to understand we miss some variables. We think that we did X and therefore Y happened, but actually we weren't aware of A, B, and C that were also happening that we didn't realize. Anyway, so there there are several personal training pre-postnatal courses that I have seen people take, and it's annoyed me in the past because specifically the um, information's wrong, and secondly, It's also being delivered by people who you shouldn't really be trusting anyway, i.e. people without good qualifications. I mean, uh, I'm questioning myself saying that because in this one specific instance, it was a nutritional therapist. They're like, oh, it's from a qualified nutritional therapist. It's like, yeah, but there's no real such thing because nutritional therapy as a generalization is a joke. The entire premise and background for these alternative qualifications, these alternative practices are based in pseudoscience. That's not to say that every nutritional therapist is good, uh, is bad, sorry. (laughs) Most are bad. (laughs) Um, But some are good because they've done the qualification and then had a realization of misinformation. This is why on Mac Nutrition Uni, some of the prerequisites that we require are not actually that good. I mean, there's not very many good nutrition qualifications out there in general. But sometimes just that exposure to misinformation then when you come to Mac Nutrition Uni it actually just gives you a better understanding of the whys because you've seen both sides of the coin which I like to teach is you know learn everything learn both sides of the argument so that you have a fuller understanding so you can explain it to people from where they're coming from and their exposure anyway off topic so I dislike the misinformation in this this realm because a lot of it is being taught in in accredited hashtag accreditation, accredited courses, um, and it's just plain wrong. So anyway, first and foremost, you know, thank you very much to everyone who filled in the form on the website. That's why this has come about. I looked in the listener questions document on on the podcast page of my website. We have an Excel spreadsheet that we update, and there was just loads of questions in this area. And actually, I'm going to make this episode very specific to not just breastfeeding, because there's lots of questions about nutrition and breastfeeding we could cover, but specifically this one that, that came up a bit. And then when I put up my Instagram story and said, you know, any extra questions I'm going to be recording, and there's just um, dozens around losing fat whilst breastfeeding, calories whilst breastfeeding, uh, etc. So specifically, the question comes back to milk supply, more often than not, the adequate nutrition for the baby, because realistically, that's what mothers really, really care about, Uh, which is nice, obviously. Uh, And mothers and parents, I should probably say, but mothers are the one that obviously are breastfeeding. And um, 
people with mammary glands. There you go. That's probably the most PC thing you can say. People with mammary glands. <sighs> don't, don't. Okay, just don't. But what's also cool is the body physiologically gives preferential treatment to the baby, to breast milk. So I'll talk about this later. But the nutrition in the breast milk is prioritized over the mother's needs. So actually the mother is the one at real risk of deficiencies as opposed to the baby. So getting into this, I wrote down a, a few comments, questions, or just three actually, here, about things people have been told. So for instance, I need at least, I was told, I think this is by a healthcare visitor, I need at least 1800 calories a day to maintain milk supply. But like today, I've only managed 1200 calories. Can't remember where that was from. Maybe it was a question sent to me and uh, people getting overly worried. Another one, I've been told to eat 300 to 500 extra calories a day whilst breastfeeding. Uh, this was actually one that was said to us at a breastfeeding class. And it's not that bad. And it was said with good intentions. But it just annoyed me because have a basket by your sofa with biscuits to snack on as it can be difficult to get up when you're holding a sleeping baby. It just was like, eh, I get where you're coming from. And there's nothing wrong with biscuits. But just don't talk about nutrition. Just say snacks, uh, whatever. Anyway, it just, it was the way it was delivered. Uh, maybe it was because I was about to become a new parent. I didn't like it. Here's the deal. Lactation. There is an increase in energy expenditure as a result of breastfeeding. Now, lots of people have asked me to quantify that. And I can't because it depends on whether you're breastfeeding one baby or more than one. It depends on how big that baby is, how fast that baby grows, you as a person, your genetics. And you. the other thing as well is you don't really need to know exactly how many because lots of different things will change. Hold on one minute. I'm just, I have a light here for those of you who watch on YouTube and it was banging, sorry. Uh, and it was putting me off. Uh, so it depends on your person. You don't really need to know, but there is an elevation. Now, we can throw out figures, 200, 300, 400, 500 calories. They may or may not end up being in the right realm for you. We can throw out percentages, which sometimes are a little bit better because they're relative to, so uh, you'll see papers quoting 25% extra, which, and that's kind of uh, of basal, Need. So if someone's basal is um, 1,600 calories, then we increase that by 25%. So it's a quarter extra, easy maths, 400 extra in that instance. Now, you can see how, uh, again, based on what I've said, the amount of milk being produced will determine that. So 25% is still, it's just a number that's kind of used as a catch-all, but it could be less than that, it could be slightly more than that. So the misinformation, let me just clarify, that I dislike are two things. One, breastfeeding mothers shouldn't be in a calorie deficit. Well, ah, there's a few different ways that this is put. This is a myth, this is inc incorrect. Breastfeeding mothers shouldn't be in a calorie deficit. Morons, anyone who said that, moron. Two, and just so you know, I'm 100% correct. If what I've just said has triggered you, go away. This is the safest thing. Go away and find out why you're wrong. Don't try and prove me wrong. It's a much quicker process to just go, oh, Martin said this. I must be wrong. I'll go find out why. Now people are even more triggered that I've had the audacity to say that. Uh, anyway, secondly, oh, what else do people say? Oh, yes. Breastfeeding mothers should eat 300, you know, this comment here, 300 to 500 extra calories. Again, not a correct, absolute, generalizable statement. Just not correct. You do not need to do that. You do not need to supply exogenous, outside of the body, through food and drink, etc., calories to help your body produce milk. It's not a thing. Likewise, the amount you eat 
and this is a generalized statement and and I will clarify later in the, you know as I carry on but the amount you eat doesn't really change the amount of milk that you produce it's as simple as that you can be in a famine and your body still prioritizes your offspring humans are bodies are clever like that you know if you want to put a label on it hashtag evolution <laughs> so these myths are disempowering they're incorrect they worry people and they make people put emphasis and effort where it shouldn't go which is an issue if a new parent or parents are focusing on getting calories in for because their milk the, the milk supply is an issue they're maybe not focusing on things that might actually help and they may be stressing over this and there there is actually some interesting area i'm not going to uh, research i'm not going to talk about it but around stress and mood states and these kind of things anxiety in uh new mothers and milk supply so yeah you know if anything let's not overstress people about things that don't actually help them uh, not that we ever want to cause undue stress but giving someone a small level of attention to an area can sometimes be good obviously uh so i'm just going to read you this in most populations no significant relationship between maternal weight loss and lactation outcomes has been found so these you know pre postnatal courses who are teaching people no calorie deficit you know let me let me break this down for for the most simpleton that disagrees with me hundreds of thousands in fact probably millions almost certainly millions of women have been in a calorie deficit whilst bre- breastfeeding and have been able to grow a healthy child we know this because during the 3 6 12 24 36 months and beyond of breastfeeding okay real honesty i was breastfed until i was almost 5 i know i know i i know let's move on w t f anyway lol <laughs> um it's crazy isn't it i can't believe it i can i can still remember breastfeeding anyway where were we then my little sister came along 5 years later num nums were gone actually num nums uh, what what talk that's what i used to call it what one of my tour talks i started talking about num nums it's just funny isn't it anyway let's carry on millions of mothers have been in a calorie deficit whilst breastfeeding the problem is is when you start talking about calorie counting and some of the external stuff to this external societal pressures there is a conversation to be had there fantastic but people are so dumb that they can't separate the two i you know people just go no you should just eat healthy right well if someone just eats healthy and loses body fat they're in a calorie deficit so there's a difference in question of counting versus you know really going quantitative with it versus the physiological or physics the process of the mathematical situation of there is more energy coming out of the body than going into it so a little bit of a run there sorry but my point being is the question and the stress of a woman going i would like to i feel ready to i want to try and lose some body fat whilst breastfeeding and uh you know the what's quite funny is you see this uh contradictory information in in a uh, you know when you go for your checkups and stuff it's like okay when you're going when you start breastfeeding you know you'll need to eat 300 to 500 extra calories and then on the next side it's like people essentially trying to encourage breastfeeding it's like breastfeeding is an excellent way to lose weight it's like well people aren't going to lose weight if you tell them to eat an extra 500 calories to replace it 
so anyway, it's an interesting area of research. It's it's fraught with um, people who who aren't great lateral thinkers and don't have insights into um, the different areas of you know just the just the consideration around pressuring people in certain things, the guilt that it might cause for people who can't breastfeed um, for certain reasons. And, uh, but yeah, so if we stick to science and numbers, we know people can have a calorie deficit. We know this statement in most populations, no significant relationship between maternal weight loss and lactation outcomes has been found. And the misinformation comes from two realms. Interestingly, my um, brother-in-law did his PhD with the Medical Research Council in Gambia, and uh, his supervisor, I actually did a bit of proofing for one of their books on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and nutrition. And uh, But lots of what they did was in populations where maybe famine is an issue, where energy supply is an issue, where micronutrients are an issue, so looking at micronutrient supplementation and growth and, and in babies and, and uh, the micronutrient status of mothers and, and the growth of the child, all of these kind of things. Very interesting. The problem is, is loads and loads and loads of the research is from this, that situation versus the um, affluent country mothers who have no issue with, for instance, body fat levels. So there might be a threshold. There is a uh proposed mechanism there is a hypothesis a hypothetical interaction between mother's body fat levels and calorie deficit and milk supply so if you are very lean and you have a low energy intake whilst breastfeeding your milk production may go down that isn't the case for the majority of breastfeeding mothers in affluent countries. So there is misinformation that comes from there because you look at those studies and it's like, oh, okay, I'm starting to hear that maybe increasing energy does help with milk supply and it's not comparable. Secondly, uh, animal studies like suckling rats. The difference in this instance is, as I mentioned earlier, like 20, like 15 to 25% increase in energy needs uh, or energy expenditure. This is one of the other confusions. So I catch myself when I say needs because I know what people hear. I hear needs from a uh, academic point of view as in the needs of the body. And I understand that you don't, you can supply those needs of energy with endogenous stores, stores of fat energy within your body or carbohydrate or protein, you know, it's all energy. But you can take it from, from your stores you don't have to supply it through food and drink so it's this expenditure that we will then uh either use so one one of the things is prolactin which is an oxytocin are two hormones that are released and I, i'll talk about them a little bit because they're released in a diurnal fashion which kind of mimics your sleep wake cycle which gets absolutely screwed as a new mother so um an, an area that is a little bit sparse let's say very sparse uh in with regards to research is sleep and milk production and it's an area from my personal experience has a huge impact on milk production and these kind of things so and, and in the lab i've often try to provide some practical information of, you know, if your partner or you or whoever is, re or friend or whatever, is really struggling, you know, the consideration around pumping milk, using a breast pump. Um, and we know that suckling, feeding on demand, suckling the action of that actually helps with production. That's one of our main things is Feeding on demand actually is uh, helping with lactation and milk supply. So, and actually it's, ah, no, I won't go into it. It's just super interesting. Uh, but anyway, so so pumping extra, but then 
basically doing a bottle feed like the, the the teats that you can get on bottles now you obviously have to try it's a tricky one don't go straight in uh going oh you know as like the husband or the friend or the whoever partner don't go yep i'll do a night feed and uh without having tested whether baby will take a bottle nipple because it's different but there are some really good like it's called like number one nipple uh nipples teats for milk bottles that you know mimic a nipple quite well but anyway doing that the next feed after that like if you've got one of these nightmare babies like Orly was who feeds every sort of 30 minutes to two hours if you can just give mum a break for one interim feed and allow extra sleep and rest and obviously milk production during that time, the next feed that they give, the first time we did this, it was amazing because the amount of extra milk, like Orly was milk drunk afterwards, full belly. And then it's almost like this, rather than a negative spiral, it's a spiral the other way because then she slept for a teeny bit longer and then there's greater time for the boobs to fill with milk, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the reason I laughed there is just because I remembered the first time did that like just the size increase with and and like the turgidity of the breast. Uh, it was mental. It was like a football. Uh, anyway, it was cool. Um, so where was I? Misinformation, rat studies, suckling. Yes, good. I'm back. Uh, the increase in energy needs in, in rats is like 300% or more. So, and, and this is when you know people compare animal studies and it's just like, just don't. It's so pointless. It almost categorically never transfers to humans when it's in the whole organism. You know, oh, I'm not going to go down the route of talking about in vitro and in vivo and whatever. But the point being is humans and rats are very, 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 very different. So you put a rat in, an, in a deficit. And, you know, the studies looking, uh, I just suddenly thought, because we were talking about percentages, I read one just uh, recently, which was like a 35% deficit, maybe even more. Um, it was a short-term study. Uh, you know, it wasn't, three, you know, months or anything at that deficit but you know there's absolutely no change in uh, milk volume and the, the other thing I just want to say is in some even in some of the human studies there's very very small in some of these much leaner women a small reduction in milk volume but actually the the outcome like excess milk is produced sometimes often and so an a measurable decrease doesn't then le mean a measurable uh, issue. Or well, sorry, it doesn't mean a the outcome has been measurably worsened. It just means an interim factor, milk volume, but it doesn't mean that like growth rates of the child have reduced. I, I'm actually fairly certain that's never been shown in uh, in uh, these uh, sort of affluent population studies. So. There we go. If you've got troubles with your milk supply, it's often first baby. And um, th there's also other things like latching. I mean, I'm going a bit off topic here, but it's something that I'm quite passionate about um, with regards to there's something called uh, tongue tie, which is mega, mega, mega under diagnosed caught when babies are born. And they do have, you know, sort of tongue tie checkers in hospitals but I had tongue tie and it is genetic uh, hereditary and um, partially hereditary and uh, Orly had a horrific time it wasn't caught and we were told she didn't and we thought she had colic and it was horrible and a super and then we were told that we had to wait for another I think week or two for an NHS appointment instantly went private it only cost a hundred 50 pounds the next day took her along bam tongue tie expert nurse like it's not like you're having to go to like a surgeon it's like you know you're lucky if there's someone I would have I would have 
paid almost anything, driven almost anywhere um, to get it sorted. If well, if I knew it would, I'd, there's almost no limit to the horrificness of a s- non-stop screaming baby. And instantly, it was a it was a three minute process. She just looked in her mouth. She went, "Yep, yeah, tongue tie, snip, put her on the boob, fed." fixed best thing ever best 150 pounds i think i have ever spent in fact someone asked on my story what's the what's the best money you've ever spent like doesn't have to be a lot or something like that and i didn't think of that but genuinely that is probably the best 150 pounds i've ever spent in my whole entire life or value for money uh there you go so tongue tight again with arlo didn't even bother waiting just literally took in private yep it wasn't picked up again uh snip Never had a single issue. But also on second baby as well. Even with a, a, a level of tongue tie, some babies can just get them fine if mummy's got a great milk supply. But it makes them struggle with latching. It makes them struggle with massaging the nipple to get the milk out. It's a horrific. Right. Where was I? Um, milk supply, first baby, this, that, and the other. Yeah, so so there's two things. There's two de- th- things I want to get across here. One is people who struggle, and people who don't struggle. You know, they start breastfeeding, everything's fine and dandy. But now I want to diet. Do you know what? If if you have never had any issues with your milk supply, you're it's highly likely you're just going to be absolutely fine. And you can consider if it's right for you being in a calorie deficit. Some people go, oh, new mothers shouldn't be worrying about this. That's not for you to tell them what they can and can't do. It's not for me or anyone else to pressure them into it. I wouldn't. But if they're coming to you wanting that, don't don't, um, undermine their wishes by going, no, you shouldn't be doing this. It's mental. Um, unless there was a health issue, which there's not, unless there, there, there was a danger to the baby, which there's not. So, you know, people sort of going, how much of a calorie deficit? Again, that is a really difficult question. How long is a piece of string? There's not even an answer outside of breastfeeding that I give for this because it's so dependent on the individual. And any of you who have listened to my aggressive dieting podcasts will know that I, I sort of talk about this. You, eh, inverted u-shaped hunger curve where you know you get into more of a deficit and hunger starts to come down uh, rather than it being linear and going up the greater the deficit the more the hunger so long story short I, f- I sort of feel like i've given you enough information you can diet where should you put your calories again i've given you some rough ballpark figures in terms of how much you know your metabolism might be higher as a result of breastfeeding, but then you've just got to consider how much more or less active are you as a breastfeeding mother? Um, You know, are you fatigued from being so sleep deprived that you're moving less? So realistically for me, the the best process is to uh, start, this is really how I set up most things in a utopian scenario of just eating well just getting into good habits um you know doing all the things we know that will help with appetite with satiation with the type of foods that you choose and take it from there then you know sometimes i'll say do that get get in oh okay i'm losing a little bit of that right just do a little food diary on yourself. Don't count calories. Write stuff down on paper, then pop it into something that will help you count the calories in that. Oh, I'm eating this many, many calories and I've been losing X amount of weight. Oh, okay, now I know that is a great starting point to move from. The other thing that I will say is breastfeeding does not guarantee weight loss. So in studies where there is like, purely breastfed, purely breastfeeding uh, mothers versus entirely formula fed babies, mothers who are entirely formula feeding and the comparison weight loss. And the the data is equivocal. You know, people are like, breastfeeding is amazing for weight loss. And it's not as clear cut as that, actually. 
there's maybe a tendency towards it, but it's not dramatic simply because in studies, even studies that show, okay, breastfeeding mothers seem to have, it's they often use a term, less pregnancy-related weight retention, I think is what they say, um, retaining more of the weight that you gain from pregnancy. Uh, postpartum weight retention maybe is, is a phrase that's used. Either way, you will still see in those studies, even when it slightly favor, favors breastfeeding, the breastfeeding mothers are eating significantly more calories because they're not on a calorie controlled diet in, in most of these studies. It's just looking at what's called like ad libitum eating, just eating as you will. Now, even without breastfeeding in the, mi in the mix, just by eating better, often we can, you know, the, the Hall study where it's like zero processed foods and they're in a 600 calorie deficit without counting a single calorie. You know, we see that in all different kinds of, of studies uh, and different methods of calo calorie reduction without counting calories. Non-tracking methods, as we call them in Matt Nutrition Uni. So we have this instance. Lucy's going to have to cut out that um, big pause there. What time am I on? don't know. So we know that it's not a, a guarantee. So there does need to be some level of brain power, some effort, some specificity in our eating to guarantee weight loss. Doesn't mean you have to count, um, but you can. It's not an issue. It's just bearing in mind, is it adding a load of stress? Like You have to be honest with yourselves. I'm just being providing you with information so you can make informed decisions instead of people misleading you and telling you rubbish based on the fact that they don't know anything or they haven't got a good ability to empathize with your situation and just giving their their opinion on what they experience or what they think you should do. Um, so that's really it. The, the long and short of it is, yes, you can be in a calorie deficit. No, it will highly likely not affect your, affect your milk supply. But if you are dieting hard and you find your milk supply is going down, uh, it's pretty simple. You know, I say, I've said this in many other realms. It's just like, keep using your brain. But don't be afraid to try it and your body will preferentially give your baby the nutrition. So in terms of how you eat, do bear that in mind in terms of eating nutritious foods, continue, continuing with um, appropriate supplementation, these kind of things. Uh, okay, so where, so just finally I want to talk about a couple of other things. So hydration and sleep are really two areas. Well, one thing I just want to say is, uh, I mentioned like prolactin earlier, like this is one of those things that's released as a result of uh, lactation or leads to lactation as part of the breastfeeding cycle. And that hormone specifically mobilizes fatty acids from fat stores. So it it's just another physiological way to just, like the body's doing that on purpose. The idea that we have to provide these exogenous outside of the body from food and drink calories through biscuits or whatever to make sure our body um, produces milk it's just silliness, like the body's clever. We have, we, you can observe it over millions of women that it's happened. It's just the fact if you give it this title or you count the calories, s suddenly someone takes issue with it. Right, I'm not talking about it anymore. I hope I've answered enough of your questions. I hope I've allayed any fears. I hope I've given you enough to go away with and start doing things. Sleep, I've kind of mentioned. There is a, it, uh, the research is so sparse. I'll link you to one study that did show that sleep disturbance, less sleep, was um, did impact. Um, but it's just one of those things, talking about it. Um, I don't know how much I can help you. I don't know how helpful that information is because sleep, sleep gets screwed. It's just, uh, it's more like if you're a partner, anything you can do to help them get good sleep, if milk production is an issue, uh, especially in the first one to two weeks, anything you can do is really helpful. Hydration, finally, is a big one. There's lots and lots of new mothers will get this massive, just thirst reflex 
literally at the onset of breastfeeding, which is great because it tells them to drink and they maintain their hydration. Now, for lots of individuals who, again, people who do not struggle with milk supply, hydration, because you have such great water stores in your body, it doesn't really impact milk volume, milk supply to any great extent at, until you, it's a chronic issue. So don't, the, the idea of like people over drinking to somehow make more milk, it doesn't work. Like you just need to get to adequate, which is the same as everything else. Like pay attention to urine color, for instance, pale urine um, and you're winning. So uh, the hydration side of things is yes, you you will need to drink more to maintain you hydration. Like uh, all of the, all of that fluid that's being uh, sucked out of you by your baby, you need to be replacing. Uh, milk is a is has a high water content. Uh, so it's as simple as that, really. That how much more? Again, it's just. It's just such a generalized thing. I don't like to, like the Institute of Medicine will publish figures on averages. So I think they say like, oh, it goes up like 50%. So from like two liters a day to three liters a day, but it's just great. Use that as a ballpark figure maybe, but don't let almost yourself outthink your intuition as it were. I'm thirsty. Oh, I've drank my three liters though. Just drink more. So people generally drink into thirst tend to be okay. And drinking more won't push out more uh, milk production, unfortunately. Right, I think that's everything I really wanted to say. I've gone on, this is probably a lot long, longer than I wanted it to be. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Some insights in there into num nums. And um, I hope this is helpful. Uh, it's an area I'm just super interested in and passionate about helping people with. Um, so any questions, I'll do a post on Instagram, probably Facebook about this. And um, any questions or follow up, I, I, again, I'll try and do another one at some point with some of the other areas uh, of interest around this. Um, cool. Reviews as well of the podcast. If you find this stuff useful, please do leave a review on iTunes. It's it's uh, I think I've been top two on iTunes now uh, for a while, which is pretty cool. Until next time, much love.